Hi, good morning, Temple Baptist Church. My name is Patrick. I'm one of the worship leaders over in FBC Menifee. And your leaders, uh, particularly Jonathan and Lemmy, had asked if I could uh, come and lead you all in worship uh, this morning. And uh, it's such an honor to be able to do so. Um, As we get ready to worship the Lord in song, I would like to encourage you, as it says in Colossians 3, that we sing because we're trying to encourage one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. So please join with me as we worship the Lord in song. Three, four. Watching and waiting The 
looking above Filled with his goodness Lost in his love This is my story This is my song Praising my God whisper a speaking into your heart that breaks you. And somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. Prayer is almost the greatest human privilege that we have. Hey, good morning, Temple Baptist Church family. Uh, welcome to our last exclusively online service. Uh, hopefully ever. <laughs> I hope we never have to go back to exclusively online again. Uh, next week, we are going to be back in person on the front lawn. Um, we will still have online on YouTube and Facebook if that's the way that you're watching with us. And uh, if you haven't been able to get vaccinated yet, and so you don't want to be out in person, we totally understand that. Um, 
But uh, today's going to be our last exclusively online day, and so I just want to thank you for taking the time to join us from your living room or your kitchen or your bedroom or wherever the case might be. Um, we are finishing up our third week talking about prayer uh, specifically. Next week, I'm really looking forward to jumping into a brand new series, walking through the book of Ecclesiastes. We've been in the New Testament for quite some time, and next week, we're going to be jumping into the Old Testament, uh, a book that I have just fallen in love with, Ecclesiastes, learning so much from, and I really hope to share some of that with you, and I hope that, uh, that you will get as much out of it as I have these last several weeks and months, really. Um, and speaking of Ecclesiastes, um, I'm going to share a verse from there here in just a moment, because... For the last two weeks, and now today, for the third week in a row, I've had to start our time off together online by announcing a death uh, within our community, uh, within our church family, and that's been uh, that's been tough. Um, first week, it was Miss Virginia Seha, um, member of our church for the last several years, and just very faithful and uh, very loved in our church. The following week was uh, Virginia's son-in-law, um, Pete Bailon, and uh, Sophia Ledesma's uh, brother-in-law. And then this week is uh, somebody that has been that is near and dear to many of our hearts. And uh, he was my first roommate when I came to Paris after I graduated college in 2012. I lived with him for my first three month, three or four months here, just across the street, and um, was the pastor of this church from 1958 to 1991 and then served as an elder for almost 10 years um, after that. Um, he was a Sunday school teacher for all of the time, even after he became a pastor. So for from 1958 until 2018, um, so 50 years, uh, he, was, he was a Sunday school teacher. And so he is, um, and it was past, his name is Pastor John Lyle. And he served this church very faithfully started a Christian school here that at one time was running 500. Uh, he brought uh, the uh, Spanish ministry on board um, back in the back in the 70s. Um, this church under his leadership uh, was running about a thousand people back in the day when March Air Force Base used to be open. And then uh, uh, he raised his three daughters here. Uh, all of them graduated from uh, Paris High School just down the road. And then in 2018, he sold his house that he'd lived in since they since they got here in the 50s. Um, and he moved to Kansas and lived in a retirement community there. And uh, just on his 91st birthday, um, he succumbed to an infection that uh, that I'm not even sure he was aware that he had. Um, and he passed away in his sleep. And his daughters, uh, one of his daughters reached out to us this week to give us some of those details. And um, he lived a long, very fruitful, very God-honoring life. I know for, for quite some time now, he's been ready to, to just depart this world and be with his Savior and be with his wife, Ruth. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the hope that we have of heaven. Uh, I am grateful for the life that John Lyle lived. I'm grateful for the impact that he had on so many, uh, not just in this church, but throughout this community. Uh, he was a man that loved people um, and reached out to people and um, loved his neighbors, I mean, his literal neighbors across the street. They all knew who he was, um, but then also just people in the community. I mean, he, he, was, he was well known and well loved, and uh, I'm, I'm sad that he's gone but I'm grateful that he is, uh, he's with his Savior and he's with his wife now. And uh, would you just join me in praying for his family um, and praying for our church family as we grieve uh, the loss of, uh, of Pastor Lyle. And, um, and then pray. we're just going to pray for the service as well. And then we're going to pray for our country and a lot going on. And uh, a new president was inaugurated this week. And so we're just going to pray for, for unity and peace. Um, and for the will of God to be done uh, in our nation. Would you join me in prayer at this time? Father in heaven, we love you. We are grateful for the privilege to come together around your word, and we pray that you would bless this time in your word. May you be glorified in it. Uh, Lord, I want to pray for um, Pastor Lyle's family. I want to pray for his two surviving daughters, their husbands, and their children. And I pray for peace in their hearts as they say their goodbyes. There will not be a really a funeral service. There'll be a small family graveside service, and that's going to be it. Um, and so I pray that you would allow the family to grieve, 
Um, I pray that you would give them comfort in these days, uh, but also, Lord, we want to thank you for the hope of heaven, and we thank you for the life that John Lyle lived. We're thankful for those, for the, for the many, many years that he gave to preaching the gospel uh, and to, to loving people and to loving this community of Paris. Um, a good old Kansas Midwest boy uh, moving out to Southern California to love the people of this city and the surrounding area. And we're grateful uh, for the life that he lived. And we are grateful for heaven. And uh, we pray for all those that may um, hear this now and that may, maybe they are realizing the certainty that death comes for all of us. And we pray, Lord, that they would realize that there is a heaven to gain, uh, and there is also a hell that exists that, that we do not want to gain, that we want to shun. And so we pray for those that may be hearing this, that they would um, realize the, the, the shortness that this life really is. They would realize that there really is a heaven, there really is a hell, there really is a God, there really is a Christ who loved them, who died for them, who died for their sins, who rose again, and has said that anyone who follows him can also have that hope of heaven. And I pray that today may be the day that they turn from their sin, they turn to Christ, and they are saved, and they experience the same hope that John Lyle had. God, we pray for our, our nation right now. We pray for our new president and vice president, uh, President Biden and uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, and we pray for wisdom that they would lead in a way that, uh, that, that seeks truth and righteousness for our nation. We pray for them to uh, also come to the saving knowledge of Christ, if they have not already, and we pray that um, our nation would begin healing with many of the wounds that it faces, and we want to obey Scripture and pray for our leaders President, Vice President, the new Senate, the new Congress, our Supreme Court, our Governor, our uh, state uh, representatives, our, our City Council, Lord. We pray for all of them, uh, that we may be able to live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness in Christ Jesus. Would you um, lead our leaders in such a way that that is a reality for your people in the United States of America? We are grateful to live in this country. We are grateful for peaceful transitions of power uh, like what happened today, and, uh, and we pray for that to continue, um, and that as Americans that we would take advantage of the freedoms that we have uh, and that we hold dear here, not so that we can um, be prideful, Lord, uh, of our nation or anything like that, but so that we would take advantage of it in such a way that we would... Um, share the gospel with others, that we would love others unconditionally. And when we have the opportunity to share with them why we love them, because Christ first loved us, and therefore we want to share that love with others. And uh, we pray that people could, could would, would be saved as a result of that. Um, that's how we should use our, our liberties that we have in this country. Um, not to be prideful, not to uh, keep everything to ourselves, but in order that we might... Um, in our liberty, share with others and share the gospel and share uh, physical, tangible acts of love and service to those around us. God, would you bless us now as we come into your word and as we talk about uh, prayer again this morning. We love you and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 11, and so you can go ahead and turn there if you'd like. We'll be there in just a moment. Uh, but today we're finishing up a short three-week series on prayer. And honestly, there, there's so much that we can say about prayer, right? I mean, we can talk about the importance of prayer. We can demonstrate that God answers prayer. We can walk through the great prayers of the Bible, and there's lots of them. Uh, we can talk about how not to pray, like we did last week. But at the end of the day, it's all just academic. It's all just head knowledge until we actually start praying. I mean, that's the, what, what's the use unless we're actually going to do something with prayer? And part of our problem in not praying, and part of our problem, I guess, more specifically in not praying effectively, is that we simply don't know how to pray. And if that's you, if talking to God is new to you, then I just want to encourage you in this last message on prayer to take heart. You're not alone. Prayer is honestly, prayer is not a natural behavior. Or maybe I should say effective prayer is not natural behavior. It's a skill. It's an art. Uh, it's a spiritual muscle that's got to be exercised for it to grow. But that's not the only thing that should encourage you. You should also be encouraged because even his disciples didn't know how to pray. Even his disciples didn't know how to pray. Look at Luke chapter 11 with me for a moment. Um, I, I told you I was going to share a verse from Ecclesiastes a second ago. And, how it, it, uh, and I just realized I'm still in Ecclesiastes right here in my Bible. I didn't share that with you. In sharing those... That, 
you know, three weeks in a row, it's kind of weighing on me that for the third week in a row, I was going to have to share death with you. Um, in Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse number one, just really quickly, there is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven. And it starts with this, a time to give birth and a time to die. And unfortunately, we're in that, we're in that season where it's, it seems that there's a, a time of death that's surrounding us. But we can also be grateful again for heaven. We can be grateful for the love and support of family members when we have to face the death of loved ones. Um, and we can be grateful uh, that there's going to come a day when death and sin and pain and sickness and disease and viruses will be no more. Um, and I just wanted to share that with you this morning. But um, let's go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse number one as we talk about prayer. Luke chapter 11, verse number one. He, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us and do not bring us into temptation. And obviously in, in, in the book of Matthew, you see a longer version of this prayer. Um, but here's sort of a summary of it as well in Luke chapter 11. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I just want to get really practical this morning and give us all some tips and tools to teach us to pray. And so let's just jump right into it. Tip number one, how do we pray? Number one, let's learn to pray effectively. Okay. I don't think the disciples were saying here, Lord, teach us to pray because we don't pray. I don't think that's what they were saying. They were Jewish. Jewish people prayed. They prayed a lot. They prayed in the morning. They prayed throughout the day. They prayed in the evening. Prayer was a regular part of Jewish spirituality. And there's no reason to believe that the disciples were prayerless men. They prayed. Instead, what I think the disciples are asking is not teach us to pray because we don't, but Lord, teach us to pray like you pray. Teach us to tap into God's power like you tap into God's power. Teach us the difference between our prayers and your prayers. You, you just pray differently, Lord. Things happen when you pray. That's what they were asking. Because here's the deal, right? I mean, Mormons pray. Muslims pray. Buddhists pray. Hindus pray. Jehovah's Witnesses pray. Jews pray. Protestants pray. Roman Catholics pray. Everyone prays, right? It's not an issue of people not praying. It's an issue of people not praying effectively. And I think this is why the disciples ask the question that they do. Lord, teach us to pray. And so let me ask you this in response to that. How's your prayer life? I'm not asking if you pray. I bet most people in here pray in, in one way or another. What I'm asking is, are your prayers effective? And if not, I don't want you to worry. This isn't a guilt trip. Apparently, the disciples also did not have an effective prayer life. I want us to actually take heart in that. But they wanted one, and so they came to Jesus at a certain place and asked him to teach them to pray and to pray effectively. And so let's learn how to do that together. Let's learn to pray effectively. And when, when it says that they came to him at a certain place, that leads us into tip number two, pray in a certain place. Okay, it's interesting, isn't it, that Luke tells us the disciples found Jesus at a certain place. It's as though this was the place that Jesus always went to spend time with God. And that would just lead us to a question to ask of like, where is our place to pray? There's no requirement of where it needs to be. I don't want you to hear me saying that if you pray in different places sometimes that you're somehow doing something wrong. There's nothing in the Bible. This isn't a law that you have to pray at a specific place. It, but I am saying that it is helpful to have, like Jesus did, a certain place that you go to pray. At least more often than not. And it could be in a closet, it could be in a car, it could be in an office, it could be in an auditorium, it could be inside, it could be outside. But there's something about picking a place where you can go and spend time with God. And for many of us, we don't pray because we don't have that place. Or you might say things like, well, my place is on a surfboard, or my place is at Disneyland, or my place is sitting in a, in a, in a deer stand, or whatever the case may be. The thing is, you can't really pray in places like that. Uh, you might experience something of the presence of God, and that's wonderful, that's great. But there's a difference between that and actually pray. And can I add a follow-up to that, that if, when you pick a place, pick a place where you can be alone. 
Okay, maybe it's in your office, maybe it's your bedroom, maybe it's a closet, maybe it's your car before you come into work. But just ask yourself, where can I spend some uninterrupted time in God's presence praying and calling on him? And now what I'm going to do, what I'm not going to do is talk much about content in our prayers. All right, don't, don't get me wrong, content is important. I think the content of our prayers is very important. That's why Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11 and in Matthew. But let me just reiterate from last week, the Lord's Prayer is not necessarily meant to be just recited from memory. It can be recited from memory. I recite it from memory in my prayers. It's okay to do that, but it's also meant to give us an outline for prayer. It's not just meant to be this vain repetition thing that we say and think that somehow it's going to be these these wonderful magic words that are going to uh, do something for us. No, no, no. The way we're supposed to use the Lord's Prayer is start by looking to Him as a loving Father. Use it as an outline. And that's how it starts. Our Father in heaven. In Luke, he says, your name be honored as holy. The way you may know it is hallowed be thy name. And what we're supposed to do there is we're supposed to start by looking to God as a loving Father. And then you pray about that. You ask him to reorient your heart so that the first and most important thing is for his name to be hallowed. The greatest problem in the world today is not poverty, it's not sickness, it's not politics or whatever. It's the failure of God's name to be hallowed. God's name to be set apart as holy. And you pray about that. And then line by line, you make your way through this prayer. You pray that God's will would be done on earth. And that includes in your life and in your children and in your friends' lives, etc. You pray for his kingdom to come. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. You You pray for provision for the day. Spiritual, financial, physical, emotional provision. You ask God to help you forgive as you have been forgiven. You ask God to keep you from temptation and deliver you from evil. Do you see? Okay, it's it's this amazing outline of how to pray. So you've picked a place. You've got an outline for the content of your prayers. But let me give you what I think may be the biggest reason that many of us don't have a disciplined prayer life. Because we don't have a plan. So the third tip in, in how to pray is plan to pray. Here's what I mean. And one of the reasons we don't pray is that we don't plan to do it. And now I've said this before, but growth in your Christian life doesn't just happen. Okay? Like I've never met anyone who said, you know, it's the weirdest thing. I went home and the plan was to binge watch The Mandalorian. And you know, the next thing I know, I just, I prayed for an hour and read the entire Gospel of Luke. It was amazing. No, that doesn't happen. Okay, you have to be deliberate about prayer. Now, the opposite of that happens, right? I planned to pray, or I thought I was going to pray, or I wanted to pray. We had the best of intentions, and what we really end up doing is binge-watching our favorite show on Netflix or Hulu or whatever. So you have to be deliberate when it comes to prayer. Like, I desperately, for me, right, I desperately want to work out more. I'd love to lose a little bit of weight. I want to be more physically healthy. I, I, want, to, uh, I want to lose weight. I want to have a six-pack. Okay, the, the, the want to for me is not the problem. The want to is not the problem at all. You know what the problem is? I don't have a plan. I haven't sat down, taken out my calendar, and figure it, figured out how it fits in with raising two kids, leading a church, maintaining a healthy relationship with Shannon, and so on and so forth. And so guess what? I might work out hit and miss here and there. And honestly, sometimes I do. I'll decide, you know, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put on my running shoes and I'm going I'm to go running or whatever. But it's not doing any good because it's hit and miss. It's sporadic. It's here. It's there. It's on one week. It's off the next two. It's something like that. There's no discipline. There's no plan. And so I don't do it. And honestly, this is true of anything. I read the most when I have a reading plan. I exercise the most when I have an exercise plan. I read my Bible when I have a Bible reading plan. And I pray like I've never prayed before if I have a plan. So here's the question then. Do you have a plan to pray? Because if you don't, prayer won't be a part of your Christian life. And that means that you will live a powerless Christian life. And here's what I find. When I create a plan for praying, I pray more deliberately I pray more passionately, and I pray more consistently. It puts me in an attitude of prayer, okay? So make a plan for prayer. Take out your calendar or your smartphone or whatever it is you use and decide this is where and this is when I'm going to pray, at least most of the time. You have to answer those two questions, where and when. And if you don't, chances are you're not going to spend much time in prayer. 
But here's the fourth tip. Do whatever it takes <laughs> to avoid mental drift in prayer. The disciples show us what this is like, right? So when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he, uh, he knows he's, he's about to be betrayed, and he, he tells his disciples to wait over here while he goes off alone. He says, guys, please just pray. And then what happens? They have the best of intentions. They want to pray, and then they fall asleep. And for some of us, it's falling asleep. For others of us, it's, it's just this, what I call mental drift. And let's be honest, most of us experience this, don't we? Most of us start praying, and immediately then our minds race to something else, right? Like, dear God, I thank you for a beautiful day, allowing me to be in your presence. And wow, look at that. Look at that squirrel. Oh, that's cute. Oh, I mean, oh, oh, I'm sorry. God, thank you for being such a loving Heavenly Father. Thank you for being so good to us, Lord. And, oh, man, I could really use a Krispy Kreme donut right now or a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. Oh, man, I'm, I'm off track again. You know what I mean? Like, we just get, we get sidetracked in prayer sometimes. It happens all the time. I don't think any of us are immune to it. And the problem is that our prayers are sidetracked. Uh, and, and, and then we get discouraged and we feel like we can't stay on track. And so let me give you some practical things that you can do to maybe help avoid this mental drift. Okay, letter A, have an agenda when you pray. One of the things that you can do is create an agenda for your prayers. That's part of what I think the Lord's Prayer is. It's an agenda. It's Jesus saying, here's a prioritized strategy, a prioritized agenda for your praying. And I think it's a great idea for you to follow that. Um, there's, other, there's other tools that you can use, though. Some people use the ACTS agenda, which we've talked about here before. A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Yeah, I heard of a pastor who takes a piece of paper, he divides it into four quadrants, and he has uh, praise, parish, meaning his church, uh, people, and then petitions. Pray through scripture as you read it. That's another great tool. Um, it's like the daily double of Christianity. You're reading scripture and you're praying through scripture. In fact, I would suggest that this is the best way to read scripture and keep from wandering off. Um, you read and you pray. Now, obviously, there's some passages that are better for this, like Psalm 23. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You can pray that back to God. Um, that's going to be a whole lot easier to do than you know praying the genealogies or something like that. But if you'll pray and you'll read, sometimes that can help you stay engaged in both disciplines. There are also so many Bible and prayer plans to choose from. Uh, in fact, here's a few apps that I've taken advantage of over the past few years to help me stay on track with my Bible reading and my prayer. I haven't done it perfectly. I get off track. I've missed days too. But when I have been on track, these have been great tools for me. Um, number one, the YouVersion Bible app. Many of you probably have this. It's the number one Bible app on uh, your Apple Store or on Google Play. If you just type in Bible, it's going to be the first one that pops up. And uh, so, yes, you can go and just read scripture passages, but you can also choose Bible reading plans, devotional plans, prayer plans, all kinds of things. You can uh, copy scripture and paste it. You can highlight things. You can take notes. It's totally free, and it's an incredible tool, and I'd encourage you to go uh, download that today. Another one that you might use is Dwell. Um, Dwell is an uh, audible Bible app. This one you do have to pay for, uh, but man, it's a great tool, especially if you are somebody that has to drive or commute or um, it's difficult for you to find time to sit down, but you're often you know, up on your feet kind of doing chores or working outside or mowing the lawn or doing the dishes or whatever. You can just put it on and hear the word of God and just have it wash over you. Um, then two more free apps. One of them is called Prayer Mate. This has been one of the most revolutionary tools for me in my prayer life and putting together prayer uh, agendas and plans and strategies, uh, and it will help you with, um, with ideas for what to include in that uh, agenda. And then a last one that I've started using in just the last few months is the Mission St. Clair. And so if you type in Mission St. Clair, and all of these are going to be up on the screen as well, I believe, um, for you to, uh, so that you can see these, write them down, maybe go download them yourself. This is another free one, and it's got a lot of just old uh, prayers that have been prayed by the saints over the years, more of a liturgical style of prayer. It has songs and song lyrics. It has scripture passages. Every morning prayer has a has a psalm, has an Old Testament passage, has an epistle passage, and has a gospel passage for you to, to read through. And then it's got written out prayers for you. And um, anyway, that's been helpful for me as well. So whatever works for you, though, find something and use it. The point is simply that you can't, you can't stay on, you, you can stay on track and avoid mental drift when you have an agenda. And maybe those tools will help do that for you. 
Here's the second thing you could do to avoid it. Um, pray out loud. Pray out loud. Now, this doesn't mean that you pray so loud that you're a distraction to your friends, your family, or your colleagues. Okay? You're not trying to draw attention to yourself. But it's amazing how simply articulating and moving your lips can help your mind stay engaged. I pray out loud almost every time I pray, and I don't do that to show off. Um, I do it because I know I'm so prone to wander off in my mind, and it helps me stay engaged. Okay, whisper if talking out loud makes you uncomfortable. Um, the point, though, is to keep your mind in the game. Letter C, though. Take a walk. This is another great tool, something I use often uh, when I walk around my neighborhood and pray. Pace the room, walk around, get your body moving. If you ever see a Jewish person praying, you'll notice that they rock back and forth like this as they pray. And the reason they do that is because they take the commandment literally from Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. Now, I don't think rocking back and forth proves your love for God by any means, but I will say that it, it, it keeps them engaged in their prayers. And here again, pacing as I pray is a regular practice of mine. I know myself. <laughs> okay, For me, if it's early in the morning and I stay in my seat and I quietly pray in my room, it's just a matter of time before that prayer becomes an actual dream and I'm just drooling all over myself. Um, look, I would love to say that I'm this spiritual guy that wakes up at four o'clock in the morning and gets on my knees and uh, stays on my knees and prays for two hours. And it just isn't reality for me. That isn't me. Chances are it's not you either. And so I can't stay on my knees, uh, especially if it's first thing in the morning or late at night. I'm going to fall asleep. So it's better to get up and walk around than to kneel on the ground and fall asleep and drift off to la-la land. So if you need to get up and walk, do it. Stay focused. Get your body moving. Here's the fourth thing, letter D, though. Journaling can help with this. Maybe the out loud and walking thing, that's not for you. Fine. I can appreciate that. So one of the ways that you can avoid mental drift, keep your head in the game, is to journal. Write down your prayers. I know people who've made a habit of this for years, and it's been really helpful for them. Uh, I've done it on and off myself. I Literally, what you do, you just you sit down with a, with a pen and a pad, and you use your agenda to pray. And it's amazing. Um, or you can sit at your, your computer and pray. And what's amazing about it is that I rarely, if ever, experience mental drift when I'm doing that. I stayed focused. And what I loved about journaling was that I could also look back at a later date and remember what I was praying for and I could see, God answer, uh, see God's answers to those prayers. Journaling can be an incredibly powerful tool. And listen, if you find a place and you have a plan and you do what's necessary to keep from drifting mentally, your prayer life will grow by leaps and bounds. And when your prayer life grows, your whole Christian life grows and it impacts everything else around you, all of your relationships, everything. Here's the, here's the fifth tip for how to pray. Pray until you pray. <laughs> pray until you pray. And I know that sounds weird, and I didn't make this up. It's what the Puritans used to say uh, hundreds of years ago. Uh, D.A. Carson, a modern theologian, he describes what they meant uh, this way. He says, what they meant is that Christians should pray long enough and honestly enough at a single session to get past the feeling of formalism and unreality that attends most praying. That formalism, that idea that it almost doesn't feel like you're talking to a father. It feels like maybe you're just doing this because you're supposed to, or maybe you're talking to more of like a boss or a king, and you're trying to use all this flowery language, and you're not really praying honestly to God. And it says, pray long enough and honestly enough at a single session to get past those feelings. Pray until you pray. Because here's what happens. See, most of us rush into and out of pray. I'm guilty of this. And we do that because we know we're supposed to. It's our duty, and we never enter into the delight of prayer. We always stay in the duty category. But the most effective prayers are ones where people stick to it and stay with it until they feel the delight of God's presence. Jude chapter 20, or Jude verse number 20, calls it praying in the Holy Spirit, which means that apparently it's possible to pray not in the Holy Spirit, which is frightening. Now, please hear me, though. This is not my attempt to shackle you with sanctified chains and tell you this is exactly how you have to do it. There is no formula that we're given in Scripture for exactly how we must pray every single time. But we do see tools. We do see principles. We do see different ideas. So don't, don't hear me saying that here's all this list of things that you now have to add to your life to do. This is me trying to equip you with tools that will help you live a more thriving, profitable, effective,
effective Christian life by seeing your prayers answered, by, by, by prayer becoming a delight and not just a chore. Because if we're going to make progress in our prayer lives, if we're going to see power unleashed in our church and in our personal lives, then it will only come through prayer. And I want your prayers to be effective. And here's the last thing, the last tip for how to pray. Pursue a relationship rather than just a routine. Listen, it's okay to do it out of duty sometimes. But you don't want your entire Christian life. You don't want your entire prayer life to be done just because you're supposed to, just because God said pray. You want to do it because you enjoy doing it, because you're talking to your Heavenly Father and you feel the delight and the presence of God as you do it. And the way you can do that is by pursuing a relationship rather than just a routine. And I just want to end with this quote from J.I. Packer as he talks about this. He says, I start with the truism that each Christian's prayer life, like every good marriage, has in it common factors about which one can generalize and also uniqueness which no other Christian's prayer, prayer life will quite match. You are you and I am I and we must each find our own way with God and there is no recipe for prayer that can work for us like a handyman's do-it-yourself manual or a cookbook where the claim is that if you follow the instructions, you can't go wrong. No, praying is not like carpentry or cookery. It is the active exercise of a personal relationship, a kind of friendship with the living God and his son, Jesus Christ. And the way it goes is more under divine control than under ours. And I love the statement that he makes next. He says, books on praying, like marriage manuals, are not to be treated with slavish superstition, as if perfection of technique is the answer to all its difficulties. Like if I just follow the ABCs of prayer, then it's just going to work. No. Their purpose, rather, just like this sermon's purpose, is to suggest things to try. But as in other close relationships, so in prayer. You have to find out by trial and error what's right for you. And you learn to pray by praying. The only way you're going to get better at this, the only way you're going to enjoy it more is by doing it more. It's, just, it, it, it's a muscle you have to exercise. He goes on, though. Some of us talk more, others less. Some are constantly vocal. Others cultivate silence before God as their way of adoration. Some slip into glossolalia, which is a form of speaking in tongues. Others make a point of not slipping into it. Yet we may all be praying as God means us to do. The only rules are stay within biblical guidelines. And within those guidelines, as John Chapman puts it, pray as you can and don't pray as you can't. So I hope today there have just been some tools that you can have in your toolkit, that you can try. That will make prayer for you move from the realm of duty to delight. Where you will feel and experience and enjoy the very presence of God as you communicate to Him, as you pour out your heart to Him, as you beg for Him to do what only He can do in your life, in the life of your family and friends and loved ones and community. But at the end of the day, just pray. Let's make sure to make this a habit in our lives. If we want to see God do something in our lives and in our families and our communities and in this church in 2021 and beyond, it will not happen apart from prayer. So let's pray, church. Father in heaven, we love you. And I want to be the first to come to you and confess that I often do not pray as I should. There are times when I skip. There are times when I rush right into it and rush right out of it where it is nothing more than a duty. It's to, it's to check it off of a box. I've, I've, I've gone back to my old ways of, of, of the law and simply just o obeying for obedience sake and not because I love you and I enjoy you and I adore you. And God, I think we can all be guilty of that sometimes. Would you help us, Lord, to move from that realm of duty to that realm of delight in prayer? Would you meet with us in our prayers? As we try maybe different things, but all within biblical guidelines to have a more effective and enjoyable prayer life, would you meet with us? Would you help us to see uh, answers to prayer? Would you help us to see the fruit of our prayers? Would you allow our church and our, the, the people of Temple Baptist Church to be a people of prayer? 
And would you allow the world around us to see that we are a people of prayer and to see the benefits of that and to see the way God meets with us in our joys and in our sorrows and our victories and our defeats. Help us to be a people of prayer. Father, for those that may be watching today that do not yet know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that today may be the day, or I pray that the first prayer that they would pray, the first effective prayer, will be the prayer of repentance, of agreeing with you that they are sinners that deserve to be punished for their sin, but then look to you as Lord of their lives that paid the price for their sin and rose again from the grave, ensuring that they can have deliverance from sin, they can have the hope of heaven, and they can have eternal life with you. Lord, we love you. We are grateful for these truths. We're thankful that, that Christ himself gave us this pattern of prayer in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. We love you and we pray all these things in Christ's precious holy name. I love you, church family. Thanks for joining me these last three weeks, the first three weeks of 2021. I hope that if you're able to, you will join us next week in person on the front lawn. Uh, and if not, then I will see you online again next week. I love you, church family. Have a great afternoon. Hey, good morning, TBC friends. Thanks for joining us today. If you're new and you're joining us for the first time this morning, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. We just wrapped up our series on prayer. And so if you missed any previous messages, please feel free to head on over to our church website at paris.church. There you can watch previous messages in this series, or you can also watch previous sermon series that took place here at Temple Baptist Church. But when it comes to prayer, I'm a pacer. I like to pace around. I like to walk around while I'm praying. That's just me. I kind of look crazy doing it, but hey, that's what works for me. But not only do I like to walk and pace while I'm praying, I like to pray out loud, which makes me even look more like a madman, more like a crazy guy. Um, but again, that is me. And so whatever works for you, as long as you do it, pray more, pray often. Um, that is the end goal. And you should be praying not out of duty, but because it's a privilege to be enjoyed for the life of a believer. Now, speaking of prayer, we will be meeting on Zoom this Wednesday night, January 27th at 7.30 p.m. for a time of prayer. We will come together as a church. We will pray for each other, the needs of each other, our community, our nation, and all and our world, really. There's a lot going on right now. And so we will keep you posted on social media via Instagram or Facebook if you're not connected with us that way please follow us and do so if you need prayer please email us um, if you'd like to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus a disciple of Christ reach out to us email us at info at paris.church we would love to connect with you that way if you'd like to give you have the opportunity to give this morning um, you can give online by going to paris.church slash give um, you can also text on a mobile device simply text tbc paris to 77977 and you will be given a link to follow you can also mail in a physical check and that address will be down below there for you um, as a church we are focused on making disciples and seeking the welfare of our city and when you give your contributions your generosity helps us as a church uh, fulfill that mission accomplish that and so we thank you for those who do give this morning now before we leave i wanted to leave you with a passage out of ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 and this is a call for us as saints and i wanted to encourage you with this verse 18 says this pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints we should be praying for each other always may god's grace and peace be with you all friends we hope to see you online next week here at 10 o'clock a.m on facebook or youtube or feel free to join us again back in person next Sunday at 10 o'clock a.m. out on the front lawn. Bring a mask, bring a lawn chair, and we hope you can join us in person and worship with us that way as well. 
Until then, be safe, take care, God bless.